Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Alex Coulomb and I am so excited to be here at the Next Build virtual conference. I've been looking forward to this event for a while. Uh, not so much the virtual version, I, I did want to go to London, but uh, this particular talk is one that I have tried to give uh, twice so far in the year 2020. First at a theater conference and then at a real-time, you know, emerging tech conference. And so this is kind of the premiere of it. And I've been excited about this particular talk for a while. I've been hoping for about the past five years that something like this would get to come together. So here we are, the very first project that I've been able to be a part of that was able to use virtual reality from conception to completion. And uh, that's just very exciting to me. So moving right along, because we don't have a ton of time. Uh, first, who's Agile Lens? Who am I? Where am I? Who am I from? Where am I from? New York City is one of those answers. Um, and I never quite know how to define Agile Lens, so I think that it's usually most useful to just talk about our recent projects. So right now, this is kind of since September, we've been consulting with the Perlman Performing Arts Center at the World Trade Center. This is a theater that I have known about the existence of since I was in high school. I wrote a paper about it when the whole uh, plan for Ground Zero was, was laid out. And right now my company gets to help them figure out how to integrate uh, various emerging tech, virtual production, VR, AR, holograms, projection, whatever, into theater, which is very exciting. So that's kind of consulting. On content creation, we helped develop um, a platform for the Infinite Playa, which is one of the Burning Man official multiverses, and uh, that works in VR, and that is going to be kind of a template for future VR massive multi-user experiences, all in Unreal Engine. Um, we also worked in Mozilla Hubs recently. This was a couple weeks ago. We did a live performance of a little theater piece called Jettison, where we had the actors both composited together uh, inside a browser, and then we also had them perform as their avatars kind of at the halfway mark in the show. So a little virtual theater and a uh, great little show, and it all ran in a browser, 2D or VR. It all worked together, super accessible. Um, also a big fan of teaching uh, and education and, you know, giving talks like this one. So uh, since last year or this year, God, 2020 spring semester seems like a billion years ago, but uh, spring semester of 2020, I was teaching uh, Unity at the Syracuse School of Architecture. And then this semester, I'm at the NYU Tisch School for the Arts teaching uh, drama and game design students how to give good live performance in VR along with some other Agile Lens collaborators. And uh, that's been really excellent. And then I also recently became an Unreal Engine authorized instructor, which is very exciting. And I just like to bring it up whenever I can because it feels great. <laughs> and then I can't really talk about this right now, but I do bring it up because uh, I want you to keep an eye on my socials. Check out Ibrews at Twitter because there will be more information about this soon. But I'm working on what I believe is the world's first virtual volumetric keynote speech. And that involved a, a virtual theater and uh, using some very cool volumetric capture technology. So keep an eye out for that. And then lastly, uh, I bring up David Geffen Hall at Lincoln Center, because even though I've gotten to work on quite a few virtual theaters uh, over the years, this is the one that I hope will become a sequel to the talk I'm about to give about uh, the Brockman Hall for Opera, because we've taken a lot of the lessons from Brockman and brought those and enhanced those and yes, and did those, to use an improv term, uh, for David Geffen Hall. So. Just look forward to that. Martin, invite me back next year, and uh, maybe I can give that sequel talk actually in London. And so where did Agile Lens come from, and how did we get to this point where we could actually use virtual reality across the entire design of a theater? Well, Agile Lens grew out of Fisher Dax Associates, which designs theaters all over the world. They're a theater consultant. And uh, I was working there in 2012 and 2013 when the Oculus Rift came out, and that was really um, kind of an expansion of the work that Fisher Dax had already been doing since the 80s for testing sight lines. So when I got there, we started to do these, you know, kind of simple renders to just say, hey, here's five different seating options. Which one do you like best? And we found that with these, you know, fairly straightforward um, 2D images where it's like the same seat in four different ways, but then we might get into a discussion with the client where they say, mm, I don't know, that head there, that looks really close. And you say, no, no, it's, you know, two feet away. Like that feels pretty standard. Or they might say like, oh, the stage, the stage looks so far away. And you say, oh, it's 45 feet. Like not that far. Trust me. It's like a, a normal theater, whatever. And uh, it's just very hard to convey that information in 2D. So in 2013, we got the Oculus Rift DK1, quickly followed up with the DK2. And the ability to do those same kinds of seating options 
But now where someone actually has a sense of space and presence and what it's like to, to lean just a few inches and how that affects your view, uh, that was an incredibly powerful tool. It was a game changer. And immediately we started to find other uses for this, not just sight lines, but cycling through different design options. And so the very first project we finished this for was the uh, Sichu Center for Chinese Opera in West Kowloon, China. And it was great. It was a very curvy space, a lot of rhino modeling, trying to make its way into Revit and being able to very quickly compare option A, B, C, D for especially those railings and those curves was wonderful. And then we decided to form Agile Lens as a separate company to be able to focus on building these kinds of experiences. And then over the next few years, got to work on a, a very wide number of experiences where virtual reality had some tools uh, for the Statue of Liberty Museum on Liberty Island with FX Collaborative. That was primarily a, a design review tool, which I feel like is one of the more common uses for VR. Um, Seattle Rep was a great quick little Unreal Engine study where I feel like we really captured the essence of um, what the final space would feel like and we're able to look at different options for that wooden screen on the wall um, and we're able to make it very accessible to have it like run on a phone and, and then you know we had other projects with various lessons uh, too much photorealism too quickly uh, being able to grab a section box around a piece of a Revit model and getting really useful information really fast for an internal design team but what we really wanted was a project where VR could be part of the design process through the entire project life cycle and that finally came in 2015 with the Rice University Music and Performing Arts Center, known then as RUMPAC, now known as the Brockman Hall for Opera. And so uh, we're going to go through some lessons, what, what we learned over the course of this process. Lesson one, as I just briefly alluded to, is that to feel immersed in a project, it doesn't need to be photorealistic. So right from the beginning, when we were just playing in SketchUp for the different designs for this hall, uh, no textures, no lighting, nothing that was going to distract from purely the spatial experience. Uh, we were testing sight lines here, putting different things on stage, but really it was just like, how does it feel to be in this version of the design with this on stage or the seats in this configuration um, versus others? So you'll see there's a blue scheme and a green scheme. And it was an incredibly useful study at this stage to just talk about that expansion and contraction of the different versions and test it out from different spots in the hall. And from there, as the project made its way into Revit, we started to develop it further. Uh, we got a hold of some Vive trackers. I had some fun early experiments with those, doing things like battling a ceiling fan, but then bringing it into the practical world, we found that it was really useful when we could start to not rely on VR controllers so much and actually deal with real world objects. So here, we just took an Eames chair that was in our office, uh, got a 3D model of it, and then tracked it in such a way so that while we were in the theater, we could actually adjust the locations of different seats and then that would actually make its way back into Revit, into the actual design. So we could really fine tune exactly where different locations would be. We could discover new seating locations. Um, we could check out you know, the distance from a seat to a rail. And again, talk about what that experience felt like. And lesson three became that it is useful to cycle design options for everything in the project, everything you can imagine. So we found that we were cycling everything from places to put the aisles, to places to put the railings, to the columns, to how the seating could be configured, to where we might want to place lighting locations, to what would be on stage. And we could cycle through all of these options in the same VR experience. And not only that, we could also cycle through the different versions of the project. You see the green there, that's the old SketchUp model. So that if it, at any point we're wondering like, man, I feel like we, we lost some essence of the design. Like you click a button and now you're back in where the project design was at a more conceptual level. And that became really useful to make sure that there was some spirit that carried through the entire design process. Lesson four became, it is so, so important to actively make design decisions from within VR and not so much in a design review capacity where you're just looking at the model and then changing to some different options, but actually like grabbing a ceiling and moving it up and down and saying, down, 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 stop, that's good, leave it there. Um, that has a lot of power to it, but it can also be great for something as simple as a sketch. You know, we've all seen napkin sketches and this idea that you have this, this party, this uh, uh, essence of a project distilled into a sketch. But if you do that in a, in a virtual reality capacity, then you can actually add some scale and dimension and human experience to a sketch. You're not prescribing 
wall thickness or where light is coming from, but you can have a sense of compression and release, for example, as you move through a project. And that can become kind of almost like trace paper, like an underlay as you start to lay out other design decisions. And you can start to play with um, lighting, massing, simple uh, uh, concepts that build upon each other from within VR. So this is just the standard Unreal Engine VR editor. Nothing too special here, but it's an incredibly powerful workflow as designers. Um, we also started to play with set designers. This was actually a little thing we did at a conference um, where we let set designers actually take the stage for Brockman Hall and play with just sketching on top of it. And then they could drop their designs into the actual theater at its current state and jump around in different seats and see, you know, how does that feel? And then for the railings, we really went above and beyond by making it so that there was an algorithm that started to dictate how the railing was designed. And we actually allowed the architect, Alan Greenberg Architects, to like sit down and uh, just grab parts of the railing, these three parts to it. And then within certain code constraints, they could kind of push and pull it and say, you know, what feels most ergonomically correct? And then they could say, okay, that feels good. And then that, again, could make its way back into the actual design. Very powerful. Lesson five is that photorealism does have its place. As the design gets further along, it is incredibly useful to say like, okay, but really, what's the project going to look like? And so for us, um, you know, we were in unity for the, the first couple of phases of this project, and that was great. But then when we started to get to a point where we're playing with more color and light, um, we needed something that felt a little more photorealistic. So at that point, we actually brought the project over into Unreal Engine. And here we are again in the VR editor, nothing special here. And all we're doing is playing with color, you know, and when you get that level of photorealism that Unreal kind of has out of the box, you really start to feel how color and light change the sensation of being in a space. Not to mention that it's incredibly easy to scale up, scale down uh, with a click of a button. From the VR editor, you can go back to human scale, but you can also get in this kind of dollhouse mode, um, similar to Tilt Brush if you've played in there. And uh, it's just an incredibly powerful way to look and evaluate the current state of a design. So here we kind of set a few presets of colors and then could you know, have someone put on the headset and just really quickly cycle through them. This is all, this isn't like something that's scripted and coded. Um, this just became the undo and the redo button. And then of course we populated it with people and had uh, a lot of the same functionality that we had in the Unity experience, such as the ability to jump to any seat and then seeing what that view is like. And having the room actually full of animated people, of course, had an incredible immersion multiplier to really make you feel like you are in what is going to be the final space. And taking that further, just like we played with sketching set designs via Tilt Brush, we also started to put real designs in there and some volumetric captures of, uh, you know, simple performers just to have a sense of activity and what it's like in the space. We also played with changing the capacity. And uh, I'll tell you, it's, it's very sad to be uh, standing on the stage and pretending to perform and only having 25% capacity. On the other hand, uh, it feels very cool to be there on the stage and have a virtual standing ovation. I've had a few, let's say, guest stars come to the office in New York City, and they always get a kick out of being on the stage. And I press a little button that makes everyone cheer and clap for them. <laughs> I'll do that for you too. If anyone wants to come to my office in New York City, you will get a standing ovation. Lesson six is once you have a really robust VR model, especially when you're at that photo real level, it's a great place to actually generate 2D media. So a lot of times we get asked like, well, you know, do you really need to make a VR model? Can you just make us some renders or some animations? And the answer of course is yes, but like there's a million reasons why we'd always prefer to actually go as far as VR because you're actually going to understand what it will be like for humans to occupy the space at some point in a way that no other medium quite conveys. But then also once you're there, then you can start to generate um, images and animations and all those things very quickly because it is a real time model running at 90 frames per second. So a pretty good looking animation uh, can be output in real time versus if you were doing all that from scratch, you'd be figuring out what to texture and what to light. And uh, there'd be much more of a process to work through all that versus in VR, again, pretty much real time. As an example of this, uh, for the Yale Schwartzman Center, this was actually a, a fun little study that Unreal Engine did uh, from our office. So thank you, Sean Hendricks, for this. Uh, you can look up the case study if you want. But for Yale Schwartzman Center, we did this kind of study of uh, moving through the space and actually set up all the camera paths using Unreal Engine Sequencer. 
So then going back over to Rice, um, there were tons of different ways we could output things, like literally just a high res shot that's like a command line code in Unreal Engine is great. We could get things out of NVIDIA Ansel. Uh, we actually even installed the V-Ray plugin and we're able to get some great renders out of that. And then, you know, at that point you can share uh, the 2D content, which has certain benefits over VR. It's, it's more framed and it's much easier to share across the world because then we could start to mock up things like some of those different color palettes we were looking at in VR very quickly. Um, so here was a red scheme and a blue scheme and then a lighter blue scheme and an orange scheme. And the top center one was where this ultimately went over the course of about a year. And we were able to, again, just mock all this up in VR. And then once we'd made a decision, then boop, output all of these from Unreal Engine and uh, very useful for showing uh, clients over email <laughs> or anyone who doesn't want to put on a VR headset. You're always going to have people who, for one reason or another, aren't going to put on another headset. So having alternative experiences, um, like what I was showing with Seattle Rep, like on your phone, like a web VR experience, uh, is great. Lesson seven, VR is going to save everyone involved with the project time, money, headaches, change orders, uh, I don't know how to emphasize this enough. There might be a little bit more cost up front with like getting these models robust, but let's just say significant reduction in all those things. I, I felt it. I felt it on this project. There were fewer meetings. The meetings went faster. Everyone was happier with where the design was going. More people were smiling. All good news. And uh, I, I like to show this slide. This is something that's been put together by Fisher Dax Associates. Great moments in contracting where... 2D representations of design and architecture, such as a revision bubble um, or a, a call out, sometimes get misinterpreted. So the more time you can get everyone involved with the project to spend time inside a VR headset or even just a real time version of a model or something that feels fairly photorealistic, then the fewer of these kinds of headaches that you're going to run into uh, when the project is actually being built. So here we go. This is a little drone footage of the actual construction site. And it's amazing to see something like this and be like, oh my God, no surprises. This is exactly what I thought it would look like because we spent so much time inside VR, not just me, everyone on the project. Here's a nice little giphy gif, just kind of sliding back and forth between uh, our render um, coming out of Unreal Engine and V-Ray over to the actual construction site. Um, and then here's a, a render that, you know, I think is a little bit overexposed, but we could work on this a little bit more. Just kidding, that's the final project. Uh, this image, I think, just came out like a few days ago, and it's like, oh, hey, uh, great, yeah. Uh, in some ways, I'd say the render looks a little better than the final project, but there's just like a really nice level of verisimilitude. So ultimately, the goal here is pretty simple. We are trying to cut down on the design review element of using VR, where you pop your head in the VR headset, go back to a computer, make some changes in VR, computer, in VR, computer, back and forth and back and forth, and then ultimately coming out the building and having a little bit more of this, this active design, this inside out experience of you start on your computer, you do all the precise things there, you go over to VR, and then some sense of what you change or modify in VR makes its way into the final design. Um, and I'll also mention that sometimes uh, it can be really excellent to use these models for virtual architecture. That's a talk in itself, but then that involves a little bit more of a process of uh, starting on a computer maybe, masking some stuff out, maybe starting in VR, and then ultimately just outputting the thing to VR. Maybe this is a, a design uh, or an experience that has very clear functionality. Let's, let's take Infinite Playa, for example, where you're gonna have a ton of people going into the actual space and it's never gonna be built in the real world, but it still needs to serve the same functions as real world architecture. So there's some real opportunities coming up, I think, for anyone with a great design aesthetic to work on these kinds of things. Um, and anyway, on that note though, I do wanna mention that this project, you can visit it in Houston, Texas, but also we're partnered with Guru right now, and uh, also Guru is partnered with uh, NVIDIA and Unreal Engine, so we have the, the two other speakers tied into this, but you can visit the Brockman Hall for Opera in Guru's platform starting very soon. So that will actually be like a multi-user space. You could give a talk there. You could have a meeting of the minds there. Um, check out Guru in your own time. They're a very cool company. But that's kind of where we're wrapping up. So there's the lessons, all seven of them. 
Um, if you have any questions or you want me to elaborate on any of them, excited for the Q&A, or just reach out to me. Um, I am at iBrews on Twitter and Facebook, and thank you very much.